Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the lecture series, um, uh, the lecture series, the Aurora lecture series on diversity in higher education. And I'm very excited to. And now I can hear myself. Christian? Uh, I think it's a, a problem of your computer. Because we're fine here. Let me just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry everybody, I seem to have a technical problem. Have you opened the stream in another window maybe? Now we can't hear you at all. I try if my sound is good okay I don't hear myself twice so from my side is good so can you we did hear you quite well from the, from our end <laughs> not no, anymore we can't hear you. unfortunately we can't hear you at all Okay, I see that Silka puts in the chat that she has to log out and log on again. I can start in the meanwhile. I don't know if that's convenient or we wait. <laughs> I think we can wait for Silka's introduction okay. and through the magic of television, I can cut all of this out later on. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that's the convenience of the magic of the asynchronous videos and those people are attending now they just have to deal with the virtual uh, challenges of uh, with the challenges of our virtual lives and i'm i'm back can you hear me yes, oh. can hear you. very good apologies uh, to to all of you we uh, we will try again uh, very aptly, you can already see the title of today's lecture, which is the on and offline classroom, and you can see how challenging that can be. Right, uh, let's start again. Welcome everybody to this uh, session of the lecture series, the Aurora Lecture Series, uh, Diversity in Higher Education, and we're very excited to have uh, this week's speaker with us, uh, Dr. Mareke Slotman from the Fr Free University of Amsterdam. Um, before I introduce Mareke, I will let me just take you back to last week. Let me just take you back to Rina's lecture from the Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Innsbruck and remind us of a few key points she made. Uh, Rina summarized uh, various th theories and models in the context of diversity and inclusion, including critical race the theory, citizen rights uh, reflections, and, uh, and intersectionality, which we had already talked about at the very beginning of this lecture series. She also reminded us of a crucial point um, in uh, diversity and uh, inclusion studies, which is that many definitions of diversity and inclusion tend to rest on the individual commitment and hide the political and the social structures behind it. And that's something we have actually talked about when we uh, met before the lecture series uh, here in the classroom, um, that it, we have to really pay close attention to make um, our topic, our topic of diversity and inclusion visible. And we have to pay attention to whom we make it visible and who do we actually um, put in charge of being diversity and in inclusion. Do we address individuals to be in a certain way, to do diversity in a certain way, and how do uh, and do or do we address institutions like the university and the social and political structures behind this? And that's uh, that, that, that's come up quite a few times during the semester. And I think it really is one of the crucial questions. And I'm sure Mareike is going to talk about this a little bit um, because it also addresses the question of how political we do diversity in our research. And there is a demand for 
system transformation and for repoliticizing diversity. And we, we can do this exactly by going through the structures. And that's what we talked about uh, last week, and we talked about it uh, quite a few times uh, during the semester. Now let's turn to this week's uh, uh, lecture, and uh, you can already see the title, Diversity and Inclusion in the Netherlands. So we have that uh, sort of national perspective on diversity and inclusion. Um, and we are going to talk about online and offline classroom and how you can make those inclusive. Our speaker today is uh, very well equipped to do that. And um, um, let me just say a few words on Marijke Slootman. She's an assistant professor from the uh, Free University of Amsterdam uh, in the Department of Sociology, or she earned a degree in, in, in sociolo sociology. She actually started out, though, as a, uh, with a master's uh, in applied physics. So she comes from um, a very different background and she continued from the physics department to another um, foreign land. Uh, she worked as a management consultant for McKinsey. And uh, for some reason she didn't stick to that, so and she went back to university and did a master's degree in gender studies at the University of Amsterdam and then continued to do her dissertation in sociology and dissertation, which I think is a very, very addresses a very, very interesting question. Um, she talked, uh, she wrote about um, migrants as social climbers within the context of higher education. So uh, highly skilled migrants at universities and other places of higher education. Um, her research uh, relates to societal inequality and minority formation and she's particularly interested in the question what it means for an individual for an individual to be seen as a member of a certain group so she follows this sort of actor centered approach how do people feel how do people do diversity how do people do inclusion um, other studies have focused on radicalization and de-radicalization. And a uh, last aspect is that uh, she, uh, as, as many other speakers here, and I think that's really interesting that we, you know, the, the group here that we collected here um, seems to cover such a big uh, variety of, um, um, of necessities, is that she works, uh, you can see this here on the first slide, she is also the, the diversity officer of education. Um, the how to bring research results into uh, a broader public, how to follow the third mission, how to valorize our research within societal discourse and uh, make it visible, make it heard, is, is something that is very close to her heart. And uh, she will perhaps also talk about this a little bit today. Right, I've taken up too much time already, Maike. Um, I'll, the floor is yours and we look forward to your presentation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Silke, for your introduction. Um, welcome, everybody, everybody who's, wa who's watching uh, right now, but also people who are watching this later. Uh, great you're attending. Um, so let me start. I will uh, briefly introduce myself and um, explain how I see diversity as this is one of the core, uh, it's the core uh, concept of the whole lecture series, so also of my, uh, of my um, presentation. I will then dive into uh, inclusive education in online and online, offline and online classrooms. It's because we're currently doing a project on that. Um, and I'm very, we did some research on it, but I'm also very uh, curious to hear from you later in the Q&A if you have ideas uh, for me to add to how uh, uh, to how we can see uh, this this particularly these online classrooms and um, well I want to say unfortunately I think it's a bit unfortunate though we've all become experts in online classrooms for the last two years so I'm curious to hear your experiences and your uh, and your uh, your your added and what you have to add um, I will then make a slight switch. And uh, we'll explain how we do research and uh, and make policy at the at the diversity uh, um, at the, at VU. Sorry, and if we have time, and I think it's a it's a very interesting part. So I hope we still have time for for me to um, tip on some challenges that we face in in research and policy. Um, and I 
I did provide links on my slides and I also put them on my last slide. So if you're interested in reading more, then uh, you can follow the links. Um, well, this is basically uh, uh, adds to uh, Silke's uh, introduction of me. I'm both a scholar and I'm doing policy related uh, activities. And as a scholar, I'm fond of complexities, nuances, uh, 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 layered, uh, layered issues and critical thinking. But at the same time, I like to sort effects and help this knowledge that we create to make the world a better place and to uh, uh, challenge inequality. Uh, and you can imagine that that sometimes is hard. So this, 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 uh, this, this layeredness and complexity issue, somehow it's, it's always easy to be at your desk as a scholar and don't have to make the decisions. Uh, for example, the political divisions uh, uh, around, around COVID, but also the political div decisions around diversity and use the language. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, approach to combine. And actually, so you have to solve these complexities in order to, to some of the complexities to do something and to sort effect. Um, I have uh, in 2016, it's maybe nice to mention, I put down these pictures of, of uh, publications and the first one, Soulmates, is, is, of my, dissert is my dissertation. Um, and I put down the Let's Do Diversity report. You can download it too. Uh, we did a critical research. We, a critical research commission was formed in 2016, chaired by Professor Gloria Wecker to uh, research uh, diversity and inclusion at the uh, University of Amsterdam. So it's the other Amsterdam University than where I'm working now. And if you want to read more about this institutional anchorage that Silke, you just mentioned, uh, then I also refer to the report. Um, um, and the other one is a brochure. It's on the mixed classroom educational model that we have developed in the last two years at, uh, at the VU at the Free University, where I'm currently working. Um, uh, I will mention it in the in the in the, um, in my in my presentation more times. But so here, my scholarly and policy uh, attention come together. I have a brief exercise just to wake you up and keep you engaged at the other side. Unfortunately, there are very little limited possibilities to really really engage uh, in such a lecture. But I like to invite you. Um, to write down for yourself what diversity means for you in relation to higher education, to doing diversity in higher education. And so maybe your associations or your hesitations with regard to this team. And then I invite you at the end, after my presentation, if you think really themes are missing in what I told you or in, or in my explanation of how we approach diversity policy, please bring them up or, or, or or ask, and I said two minutes, but maybe for just for you to just dump your associations, one minute is enough. So let me see. This is a very white slide. That's also a very white slide. Where is my slides? I will um, repeat. It was supposed to be in the slide now, but I will read it, and so that gives us time to fix the slides too. Um, so. What was the question that I prepared? Yeah. So what does diversity mean for you in relation to doing diversity in higher education? And write down your associations and also maybe where you hesitate. Please do so. And then I will look about at, my, at the slides. Silke, is it true that you also don't see a, a good slide? Or do you see a good slide? No, I see it. Uh, I see it fine. Everything's on it. What does diversity ah. mean for you in relation to do? doing diversity and write down your associations, maybe also where you hesitate. Okay, Christian, I also, I only see a blur with, with this, with my slides now. How can I solve that? Um, I can see the slides fine. So I guess it's a problem with your internet connection. Hmm. And the rest is good. Shall I log in and log out quickly too? Might it help or? Um, I can try to re-upload the presentation. Yeah, but if you all see it good, it's maybe, you all see it well. Can you see it now? I see that it's, no, I see just white screen. 
then I guess the only option for you is to uh, re-log. Yeah. Let me try to disconnect and connect first. If it doesn't work, I quickly log in again. This. Let me see. Um, also, my connection was detected. Uh, no. I log in quickly again, and then we continue. And otherwise, I well, it's a bit annoying. Uh, let me log in again. While we're on this break, um, uh, Christian, I just uh, received an email that the the tool, the Fragets tool, apparently doesn't work. No, it should work. Well, all sorts of uh, things come together yeah. this week. The problem with the Fragets tool is that if that doesn't work, we have absolutely no way of fixing it because it's an external tool. Okay. Not sure if that or uh, that has to do um, with the fact that we all teach online again. So for everybody outside of Innsbruck, um, our university has switched back to uh, on uh, online teaching. We taught uh, hybrid and mostly in class until this week and now we're back online because the numbers in Austria have risen so high. Um, just a guess that maybe that um, kind of challenges the university network a little bit more than in the last weeks. Um, we checked on two other computers. Fragets is working fine. Okay, that's good. It's not working for someone they can always use the uh, YouTube chat, which is also active. Okay, yeah. I'll, I hope everybody heard that. And we're still waiting for Mareike to come back to us. Yes. And there she is. Yes, <laughs> I'm here. I just need the... Yeah, okay. And I actually, it seems to have worked. It makes you a very creative and inventive, Maybe. right? These uh, situations. <laughs> I'm always trying to think of, uh, of offline uh, parallels to uh, uh, situations that happen. It seems like just I just fell out of a classroom. <laughs> I disappeared and came back, but it, it works. Okay, so let's um, let's continue with uh, uh, diversity. So, what does diversity mean to me? Is this about people? Is diversity about people? Well, I would say diversity, really, in essence, is about differences in. Uh, let me see the word. Differences in experiences, perspective, world, worldview, communication styles, approaches, etc. Um, is it about people? Yes, it's about people also. Is it about identities? Yes, it's about identities. Is it about ethnicity only? No, it's about all kinds of differences. It's about these differences that have large societal meaning and societal implications. So, for example, um, the difference between left and right-handed people, those experiences in, in the world, the, the, those di do not differ so much. But when you have a foreign-sounding name or appearance, this shapes how you're treated. 
Um, when you're in a wheelchair, this strongly affects your mobility and it also affects how people approach you. So these characteristics, they shape how you see other people, how you judge their, how you judge their behavior, if you're taken seriously, uh, how you perceive the accessibility of certain groups or spaces. Um, it influences how you present yourself. If you're free, actually, to if you feel free to occupy space, uh, to take in space, um, and to which uh, the extent to which your views and experience overlap with others. Um, so this is a constructivist approach. So identities do they matter? Yes but not because identities mean something by, by itself, but because they shape one's position, one's experiences, one's chances, one's expectations, one's behavior in society. And to me, diversity is really about differences in experiences, perspective, worlds, views, communication styles, approaches, but these differ between different people because of our social identities. So yes, social identities do matter. These Categorizations do matter, um, but that's because they're relevant and are made relevant in society. Um, this is not about uh, only about single. Oh, wait, I'm finding the right button. Yeah. So this is diversity. Um, it's important to acknowledge the intersectional character of identities. You've talked about it already, and. Um, how I uh, treat issues of diversity also as a policymaker is that there's not only focus on the other, on the um, underrepresented groups to bring them in, um, but it's also how the other is made the other. It's, I like to focus on the dominant norms and how the dominant groups behave. Um, I think there's a real danger when we want to bring in uh, underrepresented people, the other, and then uh, you want to assimilate them to our own norm, to the norms that are dominant in society, and then you actually delete all diversity that's there. So to me, doing diversity is about uh, broadening the norm to include more diversity and to make uh, an institution more inclusive. Um, that brings me to, let's see, my second, wait, to the second part, inclusive education in online and offline classrooms. Um, and here you see I've jumped from diversity to inclusion, because that is more uh, about this, this idea of making, uh, of focusing on the, on the, the atmosphere and the, the, the institution itself. Um, and as Silke said, I am interested in these individual actors, but not as individual actors, but in relation to the system. Um, and um, I use inclusion. I think the term equity, I'm sure it has come up before. I think the term equity and inequality, equality is even, even um, better suitable than diversity and inclusion. But I use inclusion because it resonates more with a lot of common policy language. Um, and it's more of an unthreatening and, and maybe more inviting terminology. And that refers to previous discussions I know you had about this, this depolitization of this theme of inclusion and diversity. And I'll come to that, I'll come to that uh, uh, later also. So with regard to inclusive education, what do we aspire? Now, so, I keep on using the wrong button. Let me, yeah. So we aspire education in inclusion and education for inclusion. So education in inclusion is uh, inclusive education for me is education in which all students, regardless of their identities, their backgrounds, their skin colors, or their physical and neurological abilities, they have the same opportunities um, similar levels of belonging uh, to the academic community. And they, so they need to have the same access on the one hand. And once they're in the system, uh, I would like every student to feel acknowledged, to feel addressed, seen and heard, uh, to feel appreciated for all the talents that, uh, uh, that, that they have and 
the various needs uh, to be met, but also to inv be invited to participate and to be triggered by the, by the content. So um, uh, this requires that there are opportunities to safely engage uh, and that knowledge uh, and to engage with knowledge that feels relevant also to all students, for every student. Um, education for inclusion. Oh, and this means, oh yeah, um, education, it, education for inclusion uh, is education in which all students learn to engage with different perspectives and know to look for different perspectives and acknowledge and value them and interact with them. Um, and these two uh, uh, um, goals or approaches are central to what we're doing now at VU in, in our mixed classroom approach. And I hope it's also clear to you that inclusive education is not just beneficial for uh, 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 minority students. Inclusive education is good education, is enriching education, is critical education for every student. However, unfortunately, as you probably know, otherwise you would not attend this lecture series, I think, um, is that this is not yet the case. Our uh, uh, education is not yet as inclusive as we want it to be. Um, education and also higher education is not equally accessible to every student and not every student has the same chances and experiences the same levels of belonging. So how come? What are barriers? Not every student has the same connection with the system and not all have the same financial, human, uh, cultural and social resources. I will briefly um, mention a few. Um, for example, not all students have the same bodily and neurological functionalities. So for some, it's really harder to reach the class, to attend class, and to follow and participate in class. Um, also, yes, um, some students have much more uh, responsibilities than others. Uh, some have to balance their study with work to earn, our, earn enough money for themselves or for their family members. Uh, some have care responsibilities for children or for sick parents. Um, and it's often not, at least in the Netherlands, where particularly higher education um, is tailored to. Or, um, also, not every student has the same social context. Um, some people really re lack role models. The idea that you, as a, uh, I don't know, a, maybe a woman with a hat scarf, can reach uh, can reach certain positions. Um, not all students have the same levels of inspiration and motivation. Uh, not all students have the same level of support and information or on how to navigate the system and find your way and determine what you want or can do or what your possibilities are. Uh, and not all students have been similarly socialized. So in the Dutch system, it's really a common that you speak up, it's, it's valued to speak up in a, in a polite way, but to speak up, to be, be critical, approach the teacher, be assertive, be, be um, uh, visibly participating in class and to use a certain language. Uh, whereas for not all students, this is how they, uh, they, are, they are raised. It's not valued in all situations, all the background situations of the students. Um, so you see that it's hard, harder for them to, to navigate uh, higher education and to, for them to have their talents recognized. And that uh, relates to the last, to the last field. So it's these institutional norms. Uh, not all students are approached in the same way in the system or have a similar connection to the system. Um, the system, so our universities, are usually tailored to a certain kind of students. And there are many implicit norms, so the habitus, the academic habitus, uh, contains a lot of mechanisms um, uh, that actually, um, I want to say, pre prefers or is, is best, best suits traditional students. So white, Dutch, hetero, able-bodied uh, students living by themselves, 
um, and without many other obligations, so such as work and children and other care responsibilities. And how we define talent or how we recognize a good student or uh, excellence uh, is all related to these images that we have of these standard students. Um, that means that uh, m many minority students uh, meet microaggressions, they're a bit ignored, they encounter stereotypes, uh, or they're taken as a, st they're taken as a token, uh, they're spotlighted. So you as an exception, can you maybe tell me something about uh, uh, homosexuality, for example? Um, and also, a lot of these students, for a lot of these students, the examples that are given, uh, for example, or, or some of the, the, the content that is presented, much lesser appeal to their experiences than for, for these traditional students. And also here you see that there is, again, in the institution, often a lack of role models for underrepresented students. So, what can we do? Um, there are a couple of things we can do. This is just, this is not a uh, complete list, just some ideas uh, um, um, assembled. Um, so often there is some support for, or sometimes, not often, sometimes there is some support for non-traditional or minority students, such as summer courses we have at VU. Um, this on the one hand is good, I think, that you learn, explain, to minority students more about the system, but at the same time, it puts this responsibility for navigating the system with these minority students, and they are actually um, it's it uh, defines them as lacking, and their levels of quality are brought up to fit the institution. So um, uh, this is called a deficit perspective, and it's about fixing the other and not turning the spotlights to the institution itself. So. I think before the institutions have changed, this might be an approach you want to do as an institution, but I, I have uh, crit critical remarks regarding to such uh, initiatives. Um, also, it's important to enhance the diversity in teachers, uh, visible and un invisible diversity. Um, as teachers and as institutions, please know and acknowledge, try to know and acknowledge every student it might be hard, of course, in large courses, but nevertheless, uh, try to use names, uh, um, uh, which all creates a more inclusive environment and also opens your eyes as a teacher for different uh, perspectives and needs. Uh, what we're working on at VU, and it's, uh, it's a complicated theme, particularly in higher education, I think, is to present diversity and knowledge perspectives and content, to be critical about what is the current canon, why is the current canon, why do we teach what we teach and why don't we teach other knowledge that says something about the power structures of the universities. So, um, um, try to broaden these uh, offered knowledge perspectives and content. Uh, also important, try to variate in approaches, learning activities, and also uh, media uh, in order to, um, to broaden up the experiences uh, and accessibility of our teaching for the many students that we have. Uh, and that also includes uh, um, to have inclusive and accessible organizational arrangements. So, uh, have a good science system, but also flexibility, some sort of flexibility in deadlines can also be very beneficial for students with a lot of responsibilities next to their studies. Um, and I've put there the term dignity safety. Um, I wanted to put there inclusive climate, but as you can see, a lot of these previous aspects also are about inclusive climate. Um, so this dignity safety is about creating a climate free of microaggressions, of, of these subtile exclusionary me mechanisms. Uh, but that's uh, easier said than done. When you have discussions in class um, uh, where different perspectives engage with one another, uh, it can be hard to create uh, uh, climates where everybody feels safe. 
And it's, it's very easy to say, I want to have a safe environment, but learning often comes with some discomfort. You want to shift perspectives of people, you want them to self-reflect. And that can be very uh, an inconvenient, uh, also for the, for the uh, majority students. So there it's a fine balance to try and arrange uh, a safe uh, environment. Um, and that's also not easy all to achieve because uh, a lot of, for a lot of teachers, they see professionalism as being a neutral, uh, objective, uh, and somewhat distant um, a teacher. Um, whereas uh, such a, creating such an inclusive atmosphere um, uh, very much asks us to uh, rely on on a more personal on a more personal engagement with one another, and um, particularly in 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 higher education where we're all very rational and and we still have these, I say, illusions of knowledge be uh, objective and neutral. It's kind of hard for teachers to engage in a different way with students on a more uh, personal level, also showing their own identities and insecurities, uh, particularly in our current situations of enormous time pressure and competing obligations between uh, uh, um, uh, education and research. So this is not easy to do. And it's also not easy to achieve in online settings. We did research uh, um, last year, a master's student of mine did research about how students experience the online uh, education, particularly in relation to inclusion. And we, we, um, we actually uh, find that there are a lot of additional barriers. So for example, let me see, oh no, yeah, uh, for the special needs, uh, it creates a lot of opportunities to have online education, but we found that in the last year, just little attention was paid for those with, ex with special needs. Um, then for those with challenges with regard to money and care responsibilities, there was a lot of loss of jobs, a study delay increased the financial pressure, and a lot of people had more care tasks because their children were at home or family members did extra um, uh, demands, uh, had extra demands. Um, with regard to this cultural, social and cultural setting, um, particularly for those who um, have to bridge quite a gap between their home environments and uh, uh, socialization and this academic environment, being at home, uh, being isolated and, and with context limited to home and family, um, it's even harder to, to read and get to know these academic codes. Um, and also we see there that there is much less and much shallower context in this academic context. So you get a lot of less taste of this, what this academic habitus uh, entails. And um, with regard to these uh, institutional norms and microaggression, safe atmosphere, we saw that some people said, okay, when I'm, in the, from the, when I'm acting from the safety of my home, uh, I feel a bit safer to engage. Uh, also some said, well, when I'm uh, attending Zoom meetings um, or this distant learning actually reduces the hier hierarchy a bit, so it also increases my safety. Uh, most students, um, I don't say they necessarily felt less uh, safe, but they definitely felt less engaged and less uh, motivated. Uh, um, and also many, because the teaching was more anonymous, they felt more as numbers and it was harder to, to um, estimate uh, how teachers and fellow students act, uh, would react to your contributions, which made them actually refrain even more from active participation in, um, in, um, in online classes. So these are very varied experiences, but generally they were less safe because of increased anonymity and shallower personal relations and higher visibility. So in the Zoom system that we worked, when you ask a question, you're suddenly your 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 picture frame your camera frame is is moved to the fore 
uh, and it can be quite scary for students. Um, we as teachers are used to it, although it can still feel quite um, discomforting to see yourself in this um, in this uh, um, camera setting, though. And another uh, aspect was that um, there were challenges with regard to sp study space and technological access. So particularly students uh, who lived in, um, in, in small houses with a lot of family members, they didn't have uh, spaces there where they could study well and, um, and uh, had quiet, uh, quiet space to, to follow synchronous uh, online uh, courses. Uh, let alone having good internet connections and have good equipment. So um, there's a lack of quite steady place, fast internet connection and fast laptops. And you can see that a lot of these aspects uh, impacts all students, but the students that already had challenges with regard to these points uh, even had more challenges. So in general, we can say there's an accumulation of these barriers in the last um, uh, years with the online COVID uh, education. Um, nevertheless, this online education also creates a lot of opportunities. Uh, flexibility in time and space. Uh, there is ample uh, ways to diversify uh, the, um, the media that you use. Uh, for example, uh, um, uh, and the, the, the kind of any, uh, learning activities uh, uh, you do it's a lot, with the new technology, there's a lot of extra, it creates a lot of extra possibilities for uh, participation, anonymous participation with polls, um, also for co-construction. You can actually, with students, if you want, you can create, um, together you can create a course manual, for example. Um, you could do that uh, in, you can do that in uh, offline educational settings as well, but with the online education, at least the technologies we use now and we got to use very quickly, um, there are new opportunities. Um, and some said, well, to act from the safety of home uh, actually uh, reduced barriers for engagement. So um, we have to mention also that the experience of the last two and a half years for the universities that were normally offline to go online, this kind of is, uh, this is not what online education is by design. So this was a colleague of mine, she, she called it uh, emergency remote teaching in which everybody just transposed everything they did offline to online and did not really think about all these off online opportunities and technological opportunities. So I think, I think now it's the time to be inclusive by design uh, and balance between balance the threat, threats and opportunities with regard to online education. And if we uh, ha keep having the opportunities to uh, have blended and hybrid versions of uh, education, we might be able to uh, really tap into these opportunities. Uh, currently in this Erasmus project I'm uh, participating in, uh, we are uh, um, developing modules for teachers that help teachers uh, make their online education more inclusive. So actually we, we're currently exploring how this uh, inclu inclusive education by design can work. So in the coming year, you will see more popping up on this website. So if you're curious, keep an eye on it. So let me move to the more research and policy aspects. Normally, this would be a moment maybe to get some questions, <laughs> have a break. Now we just breathe and you, if you watch this later, you can pause it, but here we, we continue. To um, the more practical side of diversity research and policy. Um, and maybe it's nice for you to know that uh, my context of a diversity officer is the Vrije Universiteit, the Free University Amsterdam, and their diversity is core of its identity. And this is the photo on the homepage, and you can actually see how it radiates diversity, at least in skin color and maybe uh, ethnic backgrounds. Um, we're one of the most diverse universities in the Netherlands when it's about ethnic 
and migration background of the students, not of staff yet. Um, we were among the first with diversity officer and we currently have a diversity office uh, with some people with some hours that they can spend on, uh, on this team of diversity. And there's various programs. So when I think about diversity policy in higher education or in education, I distinguish various interrelated domains. So this is my basic framework that I try to tick if I, uh, if I think about designing diversity policy. So it's about diversity, let's say the, the people that are there, inclusion, so how is this, the institution doing with regard to equal chances for all and with regard to belonging? And then uh, I also like to focus on these primary processes of inclusive knowledge production. So uh, with regard to process and content, and when I fill, and then there is a focus for staff and for students. So if I fill this in, we're talking about diverse staff influx and retention and diverse student influx and retention about equal promotion chances for staff, inclusive atmosphere. And then you have to think about language and images. Um, and that there is a uh, little segregation between groups of people. Um, for students, this means equal study success and also inclusive atmosphere, including language and images and little segregation. Um, with regard to knowledge production for the research sites, site, uh, um, we advocate for diversity sensitive research. So who's the funder? Who's the team? Who are the beneficiaries of this research? What methods do we use and what knowledge do we uh, use? And for um, education, we want to develop students into diversity literate citizens and have include, uh, inclusive educational processes. And think about teaching staff, learning activity styles. What is the canon? What literature do we use? Uh, and we try as much as possible to have an evidence-based approach. And I will give you a couple of examples uh, uh, for the VU. And it's, I want to avoid to go too much in detail. So it's more as an illustration to give some more hand and feet to these, um, to these themes. Um, and I also like to refer to the uh, diversity policy toolkit that I uh, wrote. I've, I have put it on the next slide. It's not for you to read, but if you like, you can download it. So it gives uh, a lot of examples what you can do to enhance uh, your diversity policy uh, under these themes that I just that I just presented. So to go to the first aspect of the diversity. So I put on the right end of the slide. So this is about the diversity aspect of staff and students. Um, uh, and our research showed, or our inventorization showed, that, for example, 15% um, of the VU students has a second generation non-Western background, whereas for the VU teachers, it is 3%. So you can see that with regard to role models, um, we have a lot to aspire <laughs> and a lot to do. And what we do uh, with regard to, this, to these themes are, for example, the, um, there is a program that we do for, the, for, for, for students in secondary education uh, with a migration background or uh, with parents who, not, who did not attend higher education to actually um, give them more information on the higher education and also for them to um, dream and aspire. So to discover their own narratives and to help them formulate their own ambitions. And we're currently also working on a very uh, large uh, HR package uh, with inclus for inclusive HR policies. So inclusive recruitment text channels, uh, maybe implicit bias training. So try to tap all these aspects of, um, of our HR policies. Um, the second example is about inclusion and then the equal chances. Um, here I present some, uh, not for you to remember, but just as a, an illustration, um, some findings. 
So, for example, we found that students with migration background study longer and less often graduate than students without a migration background. And um, you see below that uh, for the blue bars, the, the students without migration backgrounds, there's more a higher percentage of them has a, has a diploma in four years and six years than of the of the students with migration background. It's interesting that this differs per faculty with per discipline. So there comes in the, 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 the next research project. So what is it in these contexts that make that that make um, that make a change for students? So actually I want to you want to divert the attention to the to the institutional context instead of focusing on this the categories of minority students. Because the institution is where you can uh, actually make changes as an institution. Um, the right, the right uh, table shows that the percentage of women decreases at each ascending rung of the career ladder. Um, this is something that is known already. It's, there are initiatives, gender related initiatives that we try to change, that try to Im impact this. And actually the gaps are slowly um, uh, um, decreasing. Not slow enough, not fast enough though. Um, what we did with regard to belonging is that we uh, held a survey. I did a survey at the University of Amsterdam and uh, two years ago we did a survey among the students of the VU uh, also. And um, in the survey there was, for example, the statement, I feel at home at the VU. So on the right, I feel at home at the VU. And another statement was, I see practices that I find exclusionary or discriminatory for myself and others. Um, I, and then we uh, split out the students, in this case, by migration background. Uh, so no migration background, non-Western migration background, Western migration background, international students, but also by um, uh, students with an, a minority sexuality or non-binary gender. Um, and there we see that, I don't want to dive into the details of the figures, but we see that um, not every student experiences the belonging at VU and experiences the VU in the same way. Minority students feel less often at home and uh, observe more often uh, practices that they find exclusionary. Um, don't we know this already? We, we expect it so. <laughs> um, I will come back to this use of figures later, but figures still convince a lot of people of facts that we already know. Um, so they can be, they can be very useful uh, for, for policy uh, ends. With regard to knowledge production, I will uh, just mention the mixed classroom model again. Um, so in this, we, we developed a, a mixed classroom educational model in which, uh, based on three phases, we offer um, uh, um, principles, general strategies, but also examples of practical learning activities uh, for online and offline for teachers to download and to actually try in their classrooms. Um, the aim is that, um, or the basic principle is that in education, we want to make use of different perspectives and approaches to enrich education for all students. Um, and we also have a whole training program for teachers and we try and um, help um, course uh, those who design our courses to actually um, make entire programs based on this on this model. So we're currently in a rollout phase. So these were let me, so these were a couple of just a, pract a few practical illustrations of how we use data on how we think about all these policy aspects uh, of uh, of diversity and inclusion. And uh, for the last 10 minutes, I'd like to tip on a couple of uh, challenges that we encounter in, uh, in research and policy. Um, let me get my notes. 
these are the five challenges that I want to tap onto, into, I want to discuss. First, the term diversity. I think it must have come up during previous uh, of your lectures, but this term diversity is a hooray term. It's great to do diversity. We all want to do diversity. And what's wrong with diversity? Um, why not embrace diversity? It's the thing to do. Um, and this, I think this connects with last week. So how diversity is huge, used really blocks a critical view and hampers real change. It's a normative, happy term, and it overlooks frictions and it actually might um, annoy people who encounter these frictions who think, okay, it's, it can be quite hard to, to do diversity, to be in a diverse team, to uh, look at your own knowledge in your discipline quite critically in which you have been educated for like for 20 years or even more. Um, so it does not do really justice to, uh, to experience of a lot of people. Um, and also there are two ways to, uh, um, two discourses actually that connects to this. So this term diversity is often used uh, with the business case discourse. Uh, this, this distinction, I think Laila Ach Ahmed uses as well. So we all do diversity because we benefit from it. It's great to do because it enhances our creativity and we can tap into new markets. We can recruit new students. Um, uh, the danger is that when it would not be beneficial to tap into new markets and recruit new students, why should you then continue do diversity? Um, so I, I kind of object to this mere business case uh, discourse and I always uh, uh, connect it with the social justice discourse and actually emphasize the importance for uh, every institution and every organization, but particularly for educational institutions to, uh, um, to try and reduce uh, inequality in society. Um, also, this theme of, theme of diversity really obscures structures of inequality, power and normalization. So it's, it depoliticizes inequality. Um, it distances itself from racism, sexism, ableism, decolonization, um, um, and at the same time, let me show the text and then also, so normative and happy term, instrumental use, it obscures structures of inequality and power normalization. At the same time, all these aspects might uh, explain the current attention for this theme. So this theme of diversity is actually a safe way for organizations to kind of engage with this theme of inequality. So. Um, um it's the, so the, the deep politicization of this term is also why we can put it on the agenda also and that there, there is actually some money in some places to do diversity um how do i deal with this i often uh, i never use diversity alone i always say diversity and inclusion uh, sometimes i also add equity uh, i secretly focus on the norm and the majority um, often without using too challenging uh, terminology, depending on the audience. And there is this second challenge. Who is your audience? Who do you speak to? Um, in this project that I did at, at the UFA, uh, the activist students really wanted us to use the term decolonization. And all the, the, the let's say, the less critical um, the less critical colleagues said, no, no, don't use decolonization because it really, um, um, I say it, but appals a lot of people. They don't feel, uh, they don't feel invited to join you anymore. Once you use terms as decolonization, it's the same with terms like racism and, and, and sexism. Um, so when addressing one audience, you risk alienating or antagonizing another audience because this uh, the student said, when you even don't use the term decolonization anymore, we can't use it in the future. So if you use it, it gives us some leverage to, to, use, it, to use this terminology. Um, so how do I usually um, uh, 
uh, use it. And I think I, I learned it from Filomena Asset. Uh, uh, and she said, well, as a in, in policy worlds, she does not use the critical language so much. She puts in a critical messages, but not with very explicit critical language. As a scholar, she does. Um, and also, um, I focus, oh, you see here the text, I focus on the, often on the sympathetic middle group. So there are a lot of colleagues and students who say, okay, I'm interested. I like to join. I just don't know how. So there's a very, very large group who are actually quite willing to join, who don't know the, the language, who don't know how to do this, even, I don't know even if there is one way to do it. Um, so it's this, this uh, sympathetic, broad, middle group that I usually uh, um, direct myself to. Um, challenge three is focus on the other. This cartoon said, oh, everything is covered, but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture. So the focus on the others, on the presence of others, those who are not so much present yet in the system, who are not hurt so strongly, um, that uh, keeps the focus on the others and keeps the, the, the system itself and all the norms that are reproduced by the system every day out of view. Um, it's uh, make sure that the norm remains invisible and undebatable um, and the norm seems, seems neutral and seems unchallenged. So um, uh, I do try to uh, address these norms and to disentangle and uncover these norms. Uh, and to give uh, the voice also to to also change perspective. So actually, this other woman's perspective is nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture. So this change of perspectives actually really enriches and deepens and, um, our view. The fourth challenge is what I call diversity myths. And this is one of the myths. Um, it's the myth of meritocracy. So on the left side, you see the very proud parents of this boy who really reached the success uh, bubble above. Um, and on the right, there is this um, equally um, uh, intelligent boy with a lot, lot, of res lot, lot less resources um, who could uh, let's see, with a lot of less resources, busy parents, and this man in the middle who says to the right boy, stop making excuses, you're just not working hard enough. So it's this myth of meritocracy, this idea that everybody who can come to university, who has the abilities, actually can come to university, because particularly in the Netherlands, with our funding system, there are really no barriers for everybody to, to enter university. Um, um, that really is a myth that hamper, hampers um, uh, that we look at all these barriers that are out there. Um, and we're not a meritocracy, we know that. Um, other um, myths are, oh no, we should, ev we should treat everybody the same. And you see in the right, it's a very famous picture that when you do that, when you treat everybody the same, which we call equality, um, not everybody has the same uh, results and chances. Um, and a very strong myth is also science is independent from actors and power structures. So, um, well, could fill another lecture with that one. But I think uh, after the lectures you had, I don't have to say too much about it. Um, and then the last is the use of data. It's a very intriguing one. Uh, you mentioned, Silke, my kind of interdisciplinary background. So it's, it's also uh, in the last years, I've always combined qualitative and quantitative research. And I see the value of both, but I also see the the the... I say the downsides of both and the risks. Um, I know how it works. I know when you show data, read quantitative data, it's like presenting the truth 
to people and it convinces people that you uh, really should take action even though you can use your eyes and when you walk in the university and you see that we don't have a lot of colleagues uh, of color with a migration background you still need figures to prove that it's actually the case um, so i know how it works uh, nevertheless um, so we 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 do need data to show uh, and monitor uh, inequality at the same time using data uh, as a lot of downsides, essentialization. So these students with the non-Western migration backgrounds uh, have less study success than these students, uh, the majority students. So uh, you actually create these, these, these labels that seem to determine people. Uh, and it also leads to deficit thinking. So, oh, what is wrong with these students with non-Western migration backgrounds that they don't uh, have the same study success. Um, it also uh, causes delay of action. Oh, we haven't researched it yet. We should have more research in order to understand what we should do because we, we have this evidence-based approach. And also, um, you, you, only, you overlook unmeasured effects. Um, and I think it's particularly dangerous when you have this, this small initiative, I don't know, a course at, for just students who just started or maybe an an, an um, implicit bias training. And then you measure effects. Oh, when you don't see effects, then you can easily draw the conclusion that you should not do the intervention anymore. Whereas it might also be that you have to scale up the intervention and make sure you repeat it more often. Uh, and also, yeah, you can then only convince people with uh, changes that actually have measurable effects in quantitative ways so that it opened up maybe belonging of people uh, and how they feel and position themselves in class it's hard to measure um, uh, particularly when it's about significant effects having significant effects on study success does that mean you should not do these interventions for example so there's a large risk uh, I see with this ev such evidence-based approaches. And also what I find that there are often uh, uh, um, policymakers or, or the, um, the management draws opportunistic normative conclusions. Oh, we're not doing that bad. And it's sometimes it's even, you don't even know what is large um, amount of diversity. Is it, is, it, is it much or not that you have 15% uh, stud students with, non with a non- a Western background at university. I don't know. What do you compare it with? What do you want to do with it? Um, um, and there's also a limited focus on DNI related issues because you cannot measure everything. I do have a few suggestions though, and these are the last things I want to mention. Um, how can you deal with that? Dig deeper. So never stop at the level of these primary categorizations. Just try and see what causes these differences? Is it because of jobs? Uh, is it because of uh, care tasks? Is it because of the system uh, treating uh, uh, different students in different ways? Um, and also, like my example is focused on the context. So never stop at the focus on the minority students, but also direct the focus to what do we do in our institution? Um, and use comparisons to interpret results. There's never like an absolute measure that tells you what you should do. Um, so very carefully um, consider what you want to achieve and why. And also um, collect qualitative data in, in addition to quantitative data. So um, that was what I wanted to share. I have included the slide with links and then um, I want to invite you to ask questions and uh, have remarks if you want to add something that you think, oh, Marike, you're really missing this theme when we're thinking about diversity policy or diversity research. I would uh, be happy to hear. Now, so, I've got the words to you. 
Yes, thank you so much for uh, for this lecture and also for being so open about the the sort of the critical uh, uh, issues in, in in doing diversity in higher education. I mean, uh, you said this a couple of times. You know, some things are so obvious but so difficult to actually prove or so or to dig deeper or to explain, and um, it's not so even if you understand everything and if you read all the literature, the doing of the doing diversity is not not always a very easy task and you mentioned that uh, being um, uh, a researcher and also a policy maker activist at the same time um, that's that's also one of the questions in the chat uh, that you know they're, they're difficult that, that can be quite a difficult uh, task um I, I like, I mean, there's many things I, uh, I would like to comment on, but I think um, we start with the questions in the chat and uh, we start with a really, really good question, which I, um, sorry, it's my phone, online and offline. Um, what do you think uh, how minority students should be addressed in the classroom as the minority students, as experts, I take it experts of, of the minority, or just like everybody else, and that's actually something I I have thought about quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, this is this is exactly what I mean. So it's very easy from a from a from a scholarly perspective to say what is what is all wrong to do, <laughs> but now you should think about what's right to do. I think it's uh, it can be very um, uh, how do you say it uh, uh, unsafe to be singled out because of your identity. So uh, I heard from a lot of students how even, even this, is, this is not about intentions, right? I think most of the intentions of teachers and fellow students and ourselves uh, are the best. Uh, but, but singling out and actually actively addressing, um, I would be hesitant to do that. Um, so I would treat minority students as every student uh but i i am trying to train myself in seeing in actually seeing every student because i uh, i each time i find myself uh, indeed also addressing some sort of norm you know the middle class the middle class students and middle class background uh, when giving an example i assume that everybody is a uh, 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 left-wing well, it has a left-wing political orientation, for example. And I once was very uh, clearly confronted with, in a very nice way, though, with students who weren't. Uh, so I try to be open for that, to to be in my in my knowledge and in how uh, in my in the perspectives that I present, um, uh, also more explicit to say, okay, that I don't particularly assume that all students uh, hate our uh populist politicians but to actually say that i don't like them and and so make the norms uh more explicit that i use um and and try to give more space for students to interact also maybe um in uh in safer ways so uh, my answer is to treat all students the same but to try and be more sensitive to all these individualized aspects um and acknowledge that it might be hard for uh, uh, non-majority, for minority students in whatever way to speak up. So to find different ways to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it also goes back to the point uh, of, of positionality and the fact that, as you pointed out, that staff is actually much more um, co coherent with those normative uh, categories. So, I mean, staff is and in spoke uh, very much so uh, is white is middle class is etc so it, it brings you and i mean i speak from a very personal experience it brings you into the situation where you lecture about um, colonial uh, col uh, colonialism as a white woman from a middle class background to people um who are not white and do not have a middle class background. So, I mean, their experience, they sort of, they have a first hand experience, which I take from the books, but then, then lecture about it to them. So that's something that's, that's, it's kind of an absurd situation. And I, I always try to solve it in a way that I could just address it, that I just say who I am and, and how, and also address the, um, sort of the, the, 
the, the, the question of how, how can we decolonize knowledge while sticking to a canon because you know that's what you do in cultural anthropology in a BA you need to know, you, you do have certain people you just read uh, and you need to lecture about them without making them the gods up on the pedestal yeah so, yeah um, and then, it's good you mentioned but uh, I think the first step is when you make visible that it is a norm you're already starting to track somehow de uh, destabilize that norm, right? Because um, it's, it's better than just uh, implicitly presenting this as the way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have many more questions in the chat and somebody's urgently trying to reach me on the phone, so please ignore that. A um, uh, question from Amanda from Iceland. What faculties or departments are students with a foreign background doing better at VU, uh, you said, uh, the Freie University of Amsterdam? For example, yeah. humanities or social sciences? And the current uh, VU diversity and inclusion policy seems to be at the moment mainly focused on nationals, i.g. with foreign backgrounds. Isn't it too similar to the commodified version of diversity discussed in consulting companies and corporations? And wouldn't you agree that the best way to teach diversity is from a diverse staff? Yes, I, I totally agree that the diverse staff is best not, not only to teach diversity, but to teach everything. <laughs> I think it's en enriching for, for every field to have people with diverse perspectives and experiences. Um, also for for economy or law or um, so that that that's a one that I can easily easily answer with regard to the faculties uh, I don't remember them by heart but I do know that medicine was the one with the smallest gaps um, and but I can say that um, when the the more loose structures. Uh, so, so actually, the the, the uh, courses when there are many checks and balances within the system, so that which are very beneficial for all students, basically, uh, there the the um, uh, the minority students did better. But I remember also that it was not we did this scan for Leiden and Rotterdam as well, and it were not the same. Uh, disciplines uh, in uh, it was not the same disciplines uh, uh, in the same university. So it must be something about the specific context. Also, I see that um, Silke has uh, dropped out of our space again. I can look at the chats myself. Um, I don't know if. Oh yeah, I see this. The current mainly focus on national with foreign backgrounds. Oh, I would really like to uh, Amanda to talk with you more about this commodified version of diversity. Um, it's the current diversity and inclusion policy uh, is focused on nationals with foreign backgrounds. Uh, yeah, but um, for example, also the international students are now on the agenda because they did very Poor, they, they showed very poor uh, uh, feelings of belonging in the belonging survey. So that actually did direct uh, some of the attention to international students as well. Uh, and they were also getting more and more attention for students with special needs. Um, so we tried to diversify that a bit too. But at the same time, you can't, I want to say, you can't put all issues at the same time on the agenda. So you do have to make some choices. Um, having said that, I do think that creating diversity and making uh, environment more inclusive in the ways that I've discussed um, makes all people benefit and all people with all kinds of minority identities. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was just uh, thrown out uh, for, for a short time. I don't know if you addressed this uh, question of what faculties and departments. I mean, yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have, the, the, it's also a question of language, isn't it? I mean, we, in our experience where you, where language becomes a tool of uh, expression and also a tool of, of you know, getting grades, uh, then it's, it's, it's more difficult. 
Um, should we t take that last question where when everybody has access to the university and learn whatever he or she wants to, they also have the right to be protected from uh, racialist motivated stuff. That does make them not that equal before the law or not. How should we deal with that issue despite of security? Um, I, I, I don't quite uh, quite uh, un understand. I think that probably we, everybody has to be the same right uh, to be protected. Uh, although, of course, um, you know it's 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 a question of how you relate it, it to it. Yeah. I also uh, yes. Everybody has to be protected. This does not make it equal before the law. I I don't also don't see these juridical consequences. But that might be my lack of juridical training. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, do we need to protect minority students more than other students? Is that how we can uh, summarize it? Uh, and um, I mean, I think it kind of goes back. Yeah, sorry, you go. No, it reminds me of. Uh, um, we we had a we had a, a it's it reminds me of an of an well an uh, an occasion at VU indeed where some uh, students I don't know if it's it's particularly what you, what you mean but it reminds me of it and the com the complicatedness also. Um, and that is where, where a couple of students felt um, discriminated against uh, during class. And then, uh, um, uh, what did I want to say about it? Um, then it's, uh, they, they actually filed it into a complaint while, while the teacher was trying to have, have the dialogue about it. And that really, that really conflicts. Um, so I have been thinking about how you, you deal with these incidences because, uh, you will have, what I find hard about it is that I could totally recognize that, that something that the situation was unsafe for these students and that, uh, exclusion and discrimination and racism did happen. Um, nevertheless, I, I think in the current climate in the Netherlands, and uh, somehow, yeah, let's call it ignorance, uh, but that's a too negative term. It's it's about a, a lack of awareness, or maybe even a lack of ways how to uh, discuss these issues in the same way with without with language that acknowledges everybody. Uh, I think it's it's quite hard. So I could imagine that in nearly every class we're doing or every course, such incidences happen. And um, uh, the, so I thought it's very important to have dialogues on these instances when they happen in these courses, but to file complaints, and which is also very um, unsafe for teachers. And that's not to say that teachers should be safe all the times, but in order to solve and, and have groups learn and, and, and um, make processes more inclusive, I found it a hard way, and um, uh, yeah, I could see all the complexities actually without knowing what was the best way to approach this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask a final question? And it kind of goes back to the the slide you show there, um, because I find this uh, really difficult, and it goes to to this aspect of the doing uh, diversity. How do you deal with role models? I mean, we said several times that role models help to make um, minorities visible, helps help to identify, um, to see yourself and help to belong. At the same time, this role model approach also kind of taps in with that myth of meritocracy, doesn't it? It has a sort of a neoliberal undertone in well, you know, look at that picture. You, you know, these four people made it, and they're all from different backgrounds, so you can make it. So there's, it's, it's, it's sort of a, and going back to this individual um, uh, idea that if you really try, you can. So maybe we're promising too much. <laughs> we're painting a too, too good picture of the, yeah. Um, uh, yes, I think what you say is, is true. On the same uh, note, 
if these people are not there, uh, then that shows that the system is even more closed than it would be when these people would be there. So actually getting these people there also already uh, makes the system more permeable than uh, when they would not be there. And I think these people are not only role models for the minority people that can identify with them, but also shows the rest of the world. Yeah, we do have professors of color. People of color are not only the cleanest, they are our professors, they are our mayors, they are our teachers. So I do think it's very, very important uh, that on the, all the levels, but particularly the high, higher, more powerful levels, uh, there is diversity. Yeah, whatever means, I think uh, that it even, because we so tend to reproduce the system, mm -hmm. uh, that it, it even needs, uh, well, unconventional forced measures, I think, to break open these norms. Yeah, so I'm not against quota and stuff, although I realize that it's, yeah, that it's, uh, it's very difficult sites too, but I, I think this representation is very, very important. Yeah. Thank you, Mariki. We're at the end of our time, and uh, I'd like to uh, um, uh, thank you all for, for listening to us, but especially to you, Mariki, for being so open and sharing your insights with us, sharing your expertise, uh, and for your lovely illustrations. I value uh, <laughs> them very much. <laughs> so, see you all uh, next week, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Uh,